Uh, good morning, everybody. So we got some announcements for today. Um, you guys see these little boxes out there. They are for Operation Christmas Child. If you guys have never heard of that organization or uh, Samaritan's Purse or Post On, it is basically, you can get this place here, but you can go and you know, go to Walmart, Dollar Store, or something like that, and fill up these boxes with items. And then when we turn them in, they actually get shipped like, all over the world to little um, children who just normally get nothing. So it's a cool opportunity just for us to bless kids around the world. Um, but we have these boxes out there. We only have so many, um, but we also have a digital way of doing it. So if you go to the table, there will be this form and a little QR code. You guys can scan that. And if you're like, I just don't have time to go fill one of these up, cool, you can do it digitally. And just say, hey, build one for me. Here's the money. And boom, it's done. So multiple ways of doing it nowadays. Um, but if you also have questions about what to put in the box, they, they have the forms out there and everything, all the information you guys can need. So after that, we got men's camp. That's this next Friday. It's gonna be a good time. It's like 50 bucks. Yeah, man, <laughs> heard something about it. But uh, it, it's gonna be a good time. It's with Hope Community Church and Ambassadors, but it's 50 bucks. And what you guys get for that is actually pretty cool because um, you know, the church actually covers some of the costs, but like they try to keep men in there, especially through the end. You know, like, hey, we do a steak and lobster for dinner. So it's like a nice men's camp. Um, and it's not like you're rough in it. They have cabins and stuff. There's little mattresses. Um, so I'll bring like a sleeping bag and a pillow for one night, you know? So not that bad. But it's your last week to sign up for that. You guys can do it on the app. If you have questions, go ahead and reach out to me. Um, on November 9th, we got something coming up called the Jesus Jam. And that is going to be like a concert at the Reed Park from noon until 7 p.m. We have a lot of going through uh, a lot of different bands who are going to be there. Um, we got Aaron Jemmings from here, who's going to rap. Wherever you are. And then we got, um, I think, you guys have ever been to CCF, um, Dave Robson. Uh, he's going to be one of the, the players as well. I mean, never mind, he's out. Okay. So, but we got Aaron. Aaron's going to rap. So, show for that. All right. Um, after that, so you guys have seen what's happened from Hurricane Helene. We have had a bunch of people who have been wanting to see like, hey, what can we do to get out there and help? So we're actually planning a trip to go out there and we're gonna build a team and we're gonna go out. We're right now we're looking like second, third week in November, but after service today, if you are interested in going to that, please stick around. We're gonna try to get, um, a list of everybody so we can really form a plan of how we're getting out there. Um, if you guys are unable to go, but you want to give towards that, you guys can now do so on like the giving app. Um, if you normally just say like, hey, give to, to general, like that's not a general donation. If you guys want to give above and beyond what you guys are normally giving, you can do a drop down menu and you'll see hurricane relief. And that will basically go towards getting us out there, getting us back and getting them supplies. Um, like right now, we are looking at going to Asheville, North Carolina. I'm in contact with the Calvary out there, and we're going to stay there. So like once we're there, we're taking care of, they have so much food donations coming in and take care of the teams coming in. Um, they got tents, um, or you can like sleep in the sanctuary. So it's going to be rough in it for a little bit. But we're taking care of once we get there. It's just getting there and back that we can help with. And then um, buying things for them like propane warmers because it's getting colder and they don't have power. Um, getting them propane stoves so they can cook food. Um, but yeah, if you guys are interested in giving, you guys can give, or if you are interested in going with us, it'll be like 10, 15 minutes after service, we'll have that. But um, you guys can support that. And then the last thing we have is just uh, just a regular giving. Um, you guys can give online at calvarymarana.com. We have a little wood box or you guys can give on the app. So let's pray for service. Lord, we just pray that you would speak to us through your word, Lord, that you will work in our hearts. Help us just to have a posture and ready to hear from you. In Jesus' name, amen. Check. Good morning. I think it's on. It's good to see all of you. Uh, if you have your Bibles, please flip them open to you. 
Genesis chapter 24. If you don't have your Bibles, they will project the verses up on the screen. And uh, if you've been with us in our study, we've been going through the life of Abraham, and uh, we're, we're about to, we're coming to a close, right? Abraham's life is about to come to a close. His wife, Sarah, passed away in the previous chapter, so we studied a little bit of, of his grieving process and the memorial process that he establishes for us as an example within the last chapter. In this chapter, it's, it's going to be very interesting, because just like the previous chapter, Genesis 23, We've already seen a lot of death within the book of Genesis. This is the first time we see rituals accompanying death. In this chapter, we've seen a lot of love. We've seen a lot of relationships and marriage. But this is the first time we're going to see a ritual consuming or consummating the marital vows and ceremony. It's, it's very, very cool. So this chapter becomes foundational for the Jewish people as to the types of traditions and ceremony that go into their weddings. And for us Christians, it also becomes very representative for us as well. So we're going to break this into two different sections. In this service, we're going to study just the ceremony itself. What are the traditions that are encompassed within this chapter, and why are they relevant? What do they teach us about the process of marriage, about the process of what we're supposed to be doing, and kind of the divine elements contained within there. And then next service, which is not going to be next week, we're going to take two weeks of break from Genesis. Next week we're going to talk about Halloween, and then the week afterwards we're going to talk about the election, which are going to be fun topics for sure. The week after we're going to go back into Genesis 24, we're going to look at it from a practical lens, right? What is the Bible teaching us about the way that we should conduct ourselves within our relationships? So that's going to be more of a sermon for younger people who are not yet married, but I think all of us will hopefully be able to get something out of it. All that being said, Genesis 24, verse 1 begins this way. Now Abraham was old, well advanced in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. So Abraham said to the oldest servant of his house, who ruled over that all that he had, Please put your hand underneath my thigh, and I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell. But you shall go to my country and to my family and take a wife for my son, Isaac. So as you can see, Abraham has put off getting his son a wife. And as we talked about last week, the death of Sarah seems to have galvanized his interest in getting his son a wife again. But he's recognizing he's so old that he actually doesn't have the strength to be able to do what he wanted to do, which is to travel back to his native country and to find a wife for his son among the people there. So he, he definitely is looking out at the nations of Canaan, and he's looking at their cultures and he's saying, I don't really want my son marrying into those cultures. I want him to marry into a culture that I'm familiar with, and that is going to come from my own hometown. So the rest of the chapter goes like this. He sends his servant out there. I'm just going to give you a brief overview because this is one of the longest chapters in Genesis. It's very, very long. So he sends his servant out and the servant makes it to the hometown of Abraham and he makes God a bit of a deal. He says, Lord, the first young maiden who comes my way and offers me not only water, but also water for my animals. This is the woman that you have sent my way. And while he was still speaking, while he was still praying, a young woman named Rebecca, a young, beautiful woman, came to him, and he asked for some water. And she says, I will give you water as well as your camels. So he rejoices. He gives her some jewels. He asks her what family she comes from. And sure enough, she comes from Abraham's kin. So he goes back to her home. He meets her family. Some of these family members you're going to want to keep in your mind because they're going to come up later, especially Laban. Right? So remember Laban, not the best guy. So we get introduced to her family, and they essentially agree to the terms of marriage. They agree to send Rebecca out to be married to Isaac. They have an interesting little ceremony there that we're going to talk about. She then goes back with the servant, finds Isaac meditating alone in a field, and then they're essentially married. So that's, that's essentially what goes on within this chapter. It's pretty, it seems pretty cut and dry, but it goes back into this concept that we're studying within the scriptures. The Bible presents us with a mode of living that's eternal. What God is wanting to do within our lives is he's wanting us to take every moment that we're alive, everything that we do, whether we eat or drink, and translating that into eternal glory. And marriage is no different. We live in an interesting day that marriage is not seen with very good lenses. It's not seen in very proper or appropriate or even positive ways. 
And so hopefully as we study this chapter, it will help us kind of renew a little of that understanding. Why God has instituted marriage and why it is such a beautiful thing. Because like most other things, what the Bible gives the opportunity for the believer to do is to actually participate in God's divine pattern through our romantic love. Let's read this chapter real quick because this will help us a little bit. Colossians 2, verse 16 through 17. So let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. What the Apostle Paul is saying here in this passage is he's saying that the Old Testament, which most Christians don't read because it's a little dry and a little arduous to get through, what he's saying is all of the Old Testament, the reason why it's so descriptive of certain things is because what it's actually doing is it's letting you and me see a divine pattern that we can participate with. And this divine pattern all speaks to Christ. So let's take just one element of the Old Testament that, again, most people skip over to try to figure out what Paul is saying here. Let's take the temple. So most people, when they're like, I'm going to read through the Bible, I'm going to go Genesis to Revelation, it's going to happen this time. Exodus is usually where that ends, right? And it's usually at a very particular point in Exodus. It's usually when they start talking about the construction of the temple, right? So any of you guys who have done that, you know exactly what I'm talking about because it gets so detailed. And they're using units of measure that we have no clue what they're talking about. They're like, yeah, it's like this many cubits. We're like, totally a cubit, yeah. And uh, it's talking about just all the different elements that are going to go inside. It's, it's getting so specific. It's talking about the type of metal that's being used in each of the uh, elements present there. It's really, really specific and arduous to get through. So most people just kind of check out and they go back to the New Testament and never go back. Well, the reason why it's so specific, we're actually told in the book of Exodus, and then it's repeated in the book of Revelation. The reason why it's so specific is because each and every element presented to us about the temple is symbolic of a divine pattern. And in fact, not only is it symbolic of a divine pattern, it's actually symbolic of Christ himself and his ministry to his people. So when you look at the outside, it's like the outside of the temple is the altar, and the altar is made in bronze, and there's so much I could say about each of these elements that I'm not going to right now, right? But the the altar is covered in bronze, and that's where they sacrifice. So what we see is, why did Jesus come to the earth? He he came to sacrifice himself. Why did he come to sacrifice himself? Because you go beyond the altar, and what's next? The temple itself, where the presence of God dwells. You go right into the temple, and then there's a table of showbread, right? And that represents the idea that we now, as Christians, can commune with God. That's why we take communion. It's a reminder of the fact that we can dwell with the Lord. We could have an intimate fellowship with Him. You go beyond the table of showbread, and there's all these pillars and all this interesting Edenic imagery, right? Uh, Reminiscent of the Garden of Eden. You go past it, and then there's the Holy of Holies. And this is where the Ark of the Covenant was. And it has angelic imagery there. There's just so much to say about it. But within the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God manifested. And we see that that's, again, that's the trajectory of the Christian life, that Christ brings us from knowing God through his sacrifice to being intimate through God through communion, through being present with God literally in his kingdom. That's what the temple is made to do. So the Israelites had an opportunity to participate in that pattern through going through these elements. To put it another way, they had the ability with their bodies to experience divine realities through the physical temple. Everything in the Old Testament is that way, including marriage. Marriage gives the Christian the opportunity to walk through a pattern of divine grace and love that helps us speak of cosmic things yet to come and that are now through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So let's Uh, take one passage that says this outright, and then we're going to look at the elements contained in this chapter that speak of this. Okay, so Ephesians chapter 5, verse 32 says this. So Paul has just finished speaking about practical ways in which a husband and a wife are supposed to interact with one another and how they're supposed to love one another. And, And this is what he says. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ in the church. 
Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. So Paul says it flat out. He says, what is the purpose of having a successful marriage? Because the marriage represents, symbolically, the relationship between Christ and his church. And so if someone is seeing their marriage from that lens, it gives them the opportunity to participate in the divine pattern of God in the way they treat their spouse. So when, when we're thinking about worshiping the Lord, most people think in only a theologic sense, like, oh, I'm going to worship the Lord. I'm going to church to worship the Lord. No, no, no. Everything in your life is an act of worship. And it's worshiping something. And if it's not worshiping God, then it's worshiping something lower than God, which is not good. But within our marriages, there is a sacredness contained that if I do it right, if I approach it correctly, not only is it an act of worship, I'm going to argue in this sermon, it's the highest action of worship that any human being is, pop, is capable of doing. Why? Well, it's, it's actually very simple. In the Bible, it says that man bears the image of God. This is in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27 which means that our bodies are made to represent divine things. That's why God has created us. But if you recall in Genesis, God creates Adam singularly, and then he separates woman from Adam. And then he brings them back together in marriage. So what we have there is that man actually represents a component of God, or males. Females represent a different component of God. God is triune. He is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three persons, one being. So when man and woman who are different come back together in the act of marriage, that is preserving the one physical activity that human beings can do that actually can join our bodies together, they are representing, they are participating in the divine pattern of God's intimacy. It's pretty radical. That means only in that action do we have the ability to do that. Only in the one flesh unity of marriage do we have the ability to do that. That unity is so powerful. It's so powerful that it actually could create life. That's how powerful it is. That's how glorious it is. So when we think about our romantic relationships, not only does it speak of God, it speaks of God more intimately than anything else. Yet so many people struggle to see God as being a part of their sexuality. They tend to think that God has nothing to do with their sexuality, and the opposite is the truth. Which is also, it helps us understand why the Bible is so restrictive of our sexuality. Most people are like, I don't like the Bible, it's so restrictive. You know, it prevents people from being proud in their sexuality and liberated in their sexuality. Well, the reason why the Bible is so restrictive is because of what uh, the potency of our romance and our sexuality has. So I'll use a simple example. It's kind of like uh, when we think about power or energy. So nuclear power actually has a lot of potential for energy, right? Nuclear fission and nuclear fusion can create a lot of energy. And that means that if you can channel it towards good purposes, you could accomplish a lot of good. But if you don't channel it correctly and you let it kind of run free, it can cause a lot of destruction. But you think about like a windmill, like those, those simple windmills on farms and stuff like that, it could create a little power. It could create a little bit of spark. It's not much, though. It can't get a lot done. And therefore, if a windmill goes bad, right, if a windmill stops, it stops working correctly, nobody really cares. Like, okay, the windmill's not working correctly, so you're not going to get as much power as before. But it's not a national emergency. If a nuclear power plant starts acting up, it is a national emergency, right? It's a big, big deal. Because the greater potential for good, the greater potential for harm. Because our sexuality has such a great potential for good, it also has a potential for great harm. And I think we all innately know this. Sexual abuse is the worst type of abuse because it's within our sexual relations. So it only makes sense that the Bible is saying, yeah, just like you got to treat nuclear stuff very specifically, so you must treat your sexuality very specifically so that it might accomplish its intended end and not become destructive, which is its tendency when it's not reined in. But Jesus words it this way, which I love, when he talks about his commandments. John 15, verse 9, As the Father loved me, I also loved you. Abide in my love. 
If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. We don't tend to think of God's commandments that way, do we? Jesus says, hey, I'm going to give you a commandment. Why am I giving you this commandment? So your joy may be full. So it might be the greatest joy you could possibly have. Most people, when they think about the Bible's commandments, especially regarding our sexuality, we think it's a denial of joy. We think the Bible is actually restricting our pleasure, when in reality God is saying, I'm actually interested in maximizing your pleasure. And you think that by abusing your sexuality, it's going to make you happy. It's really not. There's a particular way that is divine and eternal that you can exercise your sexuality that will bring you the greatest level of pleasure, but there's only a particular way in which you can do it. So let's go through these specifics, and hopefully you'll see what I'm talking about. Okay, first, engagement and free will. Genesis 24, verse 53 through 58. Then the servant brought out jewelry of silver, jewelry of gold, and clothing, and gave them to Rebekah. He also gave precious things to her brother and her mother, and he and the men who were with him ate and drank and stayed all night. Then they arose early in the morning and said, Send me away to my master. But her brother and her mother said, Let the young woman stay a few days, or at least ten. After that she may go. And he said to them, Do not hinder me, since the Lord has prospered my way. Send me away so that I may go to my master. So they said, We will call the young woman and ask her personally. Then they called Rebekah and said to her, Will you go with this man? And she said, I will go. So this, is, this becomes the beginning of the ritual of engagement, which is weird because you're like, why would you split the marriage ceremony into two parts? Seems like a waste of money. Seems like a waste of time. Why wouldn't you just keep dating and then you just go from dating to marriage? Why is there this weird interim period in which you're not dating but you're not married yet? It seems very strange. But a Jew will tell you, well, it's to represent the relationship between Isaac and Rebekah, that they went from not knowing one another to being committed to one another to then being married, right? So they were committed to one another before they even met, and then they met and were married. So these are the parts of the engagement process for the Jew, and they're very similar. There's a lot of similarity between the, the engagement process for us today. The first part is the signing of the ketubah. Right? Ketubah was like this contract that the father of the groom, the father of the bride, would write up together, and the bride and groom would sign. It's very similar to the marriage contract that we have today. But they would sign it at the point of their engagement, not their marriage. It's kind of cool. So they would sign this thing, and that means that it would require a bit of a divorce to break up an engagement. You couldn't just break up an engagement. You actually had to, to break the ketubah. You had to break the contract. You had to get a bit, a bit of a divorce. Now, the signing of the ketubah, what was very important, is that they were trying to negotiate what's called the bridal price. If you think about it practically, it makes sense. And you see him give the bridal price at the beginning of the verses I read, that he gives the family silver, jewelry of gold, and clothing. That's the bridal price. Think about it practically, it makes a lot of sense. Back in the day, all land was passed down through the men. It was not passed down through the women. So that means that if I have a a daughter in my home, She's bringing value into my home, but she can't inherit any of the things that she's bringing in. When she marries, you lose your daughter. She goes to the male's house, and she now inherits their land and their property. So you lose a daughter, but they gain, the family of the groom, they gain a daughter who then can bear them children and start participating in their household. So it only makes sense that the family of the groom would give money to compensate the family of the bride. Nowadays, it's kind of reversed, where the family of the bride takes on the bulk of the wedding preparations and stuff. But back in the day, it was, it was the opposite. The groom's family would actually make the wedding, and the groom's family would pay the bridal price. You know, So that, that is how it went. Now next, after the signing of the ketubah, after the signing of the contract, what would happen is there would be the engagement period. During the engagement period, the family of the groom was responsible for preparing the wedding feast. Right, And usually it was like a seven-day affair, so it was kind of a big deal. right? So the family of the groom is supposed to prepare this seven-day wedding feast, and the groom specifically would be preparing a dwelling place for him and his future bride because he's going to be living on the land. So he doesn't just want to hang out with her. Now we know for Isaac, 
his dwelling place became the tent that his father gave him. So Abraham actually gives him a tent for them to dwell in. Now the next part is the engagement ring. So we notice that the servant not only gives jewels to the family, he gives specific jewels to the fiancé, to the bride-to-be. This was supposed to be a symbol of the commitment that the man has towards the woman. He's saying, hey, I'm going to be faithful to you. I'm going to remind myself that this is a part of what I've committed to do, and I'm going to give you something really valuable to show that I'm serious about my commitment. This is not words. This is I'm actually putting a lot of money into showing my commitment to you. This is why men buy engagement rings for women. Now, in our weird egalitarian society, they're like, well, why doesn't that go both ways? Have you met a young girl and a young boy? My daughter's already talking about marriage. My son cannot care less, right? There's, there's a reason why the man has to do that and the woman does not. Finally, there's separation. This is signified in the veil. So if you notice, they're engaged. They're not seeing one another. And then it actually says when Rebecca sees Isaac for the first time, she puts a veil up. So we, we also do this today. Some brides wear a veil. Now, the reason why is because symbolically, this is the idea that Rebecca and Isaac didn't see each other until the wedding. So what a bride will do is she'll wear a veil until the ceremony commences. Right? And in really traditional ceremonies, the veil would not be removed until the vows were spoken. Right? So when we say you can now kiss the bride, that's when the veil was up. So too late. You can't walk out now. You know, the veil comes up, that's it. So that, that's the idea of separation. Now, where, where is the divine pattern? So I'm going to show you that Jesus takes every single one of these patterns and he applies it to our relationship with him. Every single one. John 14, verse 1 through 6. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going, and how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is using wedding language to explain something. The church is not yet married to Christ. We're engaged to Christ. That's why we're separated. We don't see him. Right? There's a veil over our eyes. We don't actually see our groom-to-be. We're engaged to him, we're committed to him, but we're not with him. Once again, what was the man supposed to be doing during the time of separation? Preparing a dwelling place for him and his bride. I go and prepare a place for you, that where I am you may be also. He's intentionally using wedding language to describe this. Next, how did Rebecca relate to Isaac before she met him? Through the servant. John 15, verse 26. But when the helper comes, who I will send to you from my father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the father, he will testify of me. There's a reason why the servant isn't named in this chapter. It's because he represents the Holy Spirit. Right? He goes and he meets the bride and he tells her of Isaac. In the same way, we haven't seen Jesus. The Holy Spirit comes into the life of the believer and testifies of the truth of the gospel to us. So we relate to God, we relate to Christ through the Holy Spirit. Uh, I actually did two weddings this weekend, so I'm kind of in wedding mode. But, you know, I, 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 I tell couples, like, this is what the Father represents in the wedding ceremony. So the pastor represents God the Father. The groom represents God the Son, and the Father of the Bride represents God the Holy Spirit. So God the Holy Spirit brings the Bride to the Son, and they are wedded before God the Father. That's why we do the ceremony that way. Next, there's the bridal price, Matthew 26, verse 26 through 29. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and he gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. What's Jesus saying? What's the bridal price? His life. 
He's saying, I've given my body, I've given my blood for you, so that you may know that I am serious about coming again to receive you to myself. He has paid the bridal price for us. He also says, I'm not going to drink of the vine until I drink it with you in my Father's kingdom. There was another interesting ceremony in Jewish weddings in which the bride and groom share a glass of wine after the vows. So Jesus is, again, he's recalling these traditions to show what he's doing. He's saying, I'm paying the bridal price. Now you guys are going to be with me in heaven, and we will take of the cup together. Okay. Next, the engagement ring. Does Jesus give us an engagement ring? So he pays the bridal price, but does he give us an engagement ring? Yes, he does. Ephesians 1, verse 13 through 14. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed that this, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. He's already purchased us, but he's given us a seal, a ring, as a guarantee that we know that we might be with him. What has he given us as a, as a wedding ring, as an engagement ring? The Holy Spirit of promise. It says throughout Scripture that the Holy Spirit's job in the believer's life is to remind us that we belong to him. Now, it's to remind us that we belong to God. Just as the, the fiancé, the woman who is betrothed to a man, she looks at the ring and she's reminded of his faithfulness. So the Christian, we look within and we see the presence of the Holy Spirit within our life ministering to us, and we know that God, who has given us the Spirit, will be faithful. He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. There is a seal of promise, and then there is a fulfill of promise that happens when we see him face to face. Now let's talk about the ceremony. This story doesn't show a ceremony, which is kind of a bummer, but I'll walk you through some passages that give us a, a hint. Uh, the first thing is we see that there's a procession. Uh, we see this demonstrated for us in the Song of Solomon. I'm not going to read it. Song of Solomon, chapter 3, verse 6 through 11. You could see what the wedding party looked like. It's a little more ornate than ours today. So our procession usually happens right before the wedding itself. So you have the groomsmen and the bridesmaids coming up together. That's the wedding party. And then, like I said, you have the bride and groom coming up. Back in the day, it was a little more hardcore. right? So the bride would be at her house and the procession would go through the whole town. So it was almost like a little parade, and they would go and grab the bride from her house, and they would bring her up to the wedding ceremony, right? Very reminiscent of 1 Thessalonians 4, when it talks about the rapture of the church, or 2 Thessalonians 1 talks about the same thing, that there's a procession that comes and gathers the bride of Christ up to himself. Very interesting passages. But next, there's the vows. Uh, Exodus 19, verse 5 through 8. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. So Moses came and called the elders of the people and laid before them all these words which the Lord had commanded him. Then all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do. So Moses brought back the words of the people to the Lord. This is the basis for vows, for wedding vows. If you go to a traditional Jewish wedding, they have something called the hopa, right? It's a, it's a little arch, or it almost looks like an open room that they've built, like a little open room that they've built. The, the reason for this is because it's significant of the presence of God that went over the mountain, the pillar of cloud that went over the mountain and covered the people while they made vows to the Lord, right? While they committed themselves to the Lord as his people. As married couples, the reason why we do it that way is because it's so, it shows, it signifies the commitment that a man makes to a woman and the commitment that a man makes to God. Right? There is a free will giving of ourselves to the Lord that also inhibits our hearts before him or inhabits our hearts before him. Now, the other reason why it's out, like so traditionally weddings are outside. In Tucson, I'll tell you, I'm not going to marry you in the summer outside. That's just not going to happen. But, you know, like, for most part, it's always outside. Why? Because the people of Israel were brought into the wilderness, and they dwelt in booths. They dwelt in tents while they were in the wilderness. That's what the altar also represents. It's this idea that we're out in the wilderness, and God has brought us to himself. 
It's supposed to show a little bit of the commitment that a couple has towards one another, but it also is, again, significant of Rebecca and Isaac. She meets him in the field alone, and they are married together, and then they go into the tent. So it's a little bit of like, it's not about where we are. It's not about who we're around. It's about the love we have for one another. It's the absolute commitment between a man and woman that's represented there. But it's also representative of us and our situation with God. We're married to God in the wilderness. We are not yet in our home. We are not yet with him. We are married to God in the wilderness, and we will be with him one day. Now, Revelation 19 puts it this way, which I really like. This imagery is very beautiful. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And to me, I mean, I'm sorry, and he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. Why does the bride wear white, but the groom doesn't? Because the bride represents us, the church, who are purifying ourselves through the relationship we have with the Holy Spirit, that we might be brought to our groom, pure and undefiled. So some people say that it represents a, a bride's virginity. Yeah, yes or no, not really. It represents this, the fact that the, the bride has made herself pure for her groom. She's saying, I'm dedicated to you only, I'm coming to you singularly, and my life is about joining together with you, which we'll talk more about in a second. Which brings to the final part of the ceremony, intimacy and joy. Genesis 24, verse 67. Then Isaac brought her into his mother's tent, and he took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Very interesting. This is the second time in the entire Bible that the word love is used. The first time the word love is used, it regards the father, Abraham, sacrificing his son. The second time it's used, the son loving his bride. So you see the symbolism there. The greatest act of love is God the father offering up his son on behalf of his bride. The second greatest love is the love that the son has for us individually. Now, this is represented in a weird ritual today. That's, it's kind of made into a PG version of itself, but it's called yakud, which basically means separation or privacy. So what this is, is a bride and a groom in modern day Jewish weddings. They'll go into a little private room and they'll have like a meal together or something like that. Back in the day, yakud was a little bit more intimate, right? Yakud was, was actually, why, why did the bride and groom need privacy? Well, because the wedding ceremony lasted a week. And the bride and groom don't want to wait a week to consummate their vows. So they had a little room set up for them where they could be apart from the festivities and they could have privacy. And then after they're done with their privacy, they go back and they hang out with people and they probably go back to that room a couple more times during the week, right? This is what, by making it, by the way, by making it a part of the marital ceremony itself, what the Jews were signifying is that intimacy is a part of the vows. Now, we kind of understand this today. We call it consummating. You consummate your vows in the marital bed. And in fact, we actually believe this to such an extent that there's a such thing in America as an annulment. Right? An annulment is where you annul wedding vows without getting a divorce. What are the requirements for an annulment? You can't have consummated the vows. That sounds really weird, but that's, we still uphold that view. I mean, is it true? No. But you know, like people think that it's true, and that's how our annulment process works. So consummation, right, going into the marital bed, is actually a part of the wedding ceremony. Why? Because that's a part of the wedding. It's a part of the marriage. It's what we're supposed to be doing with God. That when we go up to heaven to be with the Lord, it is an act of ultimate intimacy with him. It says in the Bible that we're not just with God. It says that God is in us. He's a part of us. There's a spiritual reality in which, as Jesus prayed in John 17, that we will be one with him as he is one with the Father. That that divine mystery of how God the Father and God the Son can be separate but one, unified, so the church and Christ will be separate but unified in heaven, and so the husband and wife will be distinct yet unified. 
This is the pattern that we're called to participate in. But it doesn't just take place within the marital bed. It takes place in all of our lives when we're joined together in marriage. We are one flesh. There is a unique intimacy in marriage that is completely different than any other type of intimacy you will have outside of marriage. And that's not just true in the body. It's true outside of the body. Let's take just one element of this, negotiation, right? So I have friends, and we disagree about a lot of stuff. And I don't really care that we disagree about a lot of stuff. If I disagree with my friends, I'm like, okay, well, we disagree, whatever, and that's it. If I disagree with my wife, that's a problem, right? Because we have to live life together. I can't just be like, well, I mean, you think that we should raise the kids this way, but I think we should raise the kids this way, so who cares? You know, There has to be some sort of an agreement. The reason why is because within marriage, uniquely, there needs to be absolute intimacy. Things need to be negotiated in order for there to be unity. Just as there is a specific way in which your bodies come together as one, there's a specific way in which your souls come together as one. You have to negotiate through your marital difficulties. And a lot of couples don't understand this, right? So what I found as a marriage counselor, that older couples, what they do, is they set up kind of what I would call spheres of influence in the home. So there's like a male sphere of the home, and there's a female sphere of the home. And within those spheres, you have like absolute autonomy, right? You, you don't have to negotiate anything. It's like, this is my, and you may even have rooms where this is true, right? Where there's like a, a male, there's a man cave, and there's like a female, and then the rest of the house is the woman. But you know, you know like man has like one location where he's like, this is my spot, you know? I don't have to ask my wife for anything regarding this spot, right? That's... That's the idea, that you have a male influence and you have a female influence. Now, there's some functionality there, but for the most part, it leads to a lot of disunity. So a lot of couples that employed that strategy in their marriage, they find out that they become increasingly separate as their relationship grows. Because they realize, I don't like negotiating, I don't like getting into a fight, so we're going to avoid fights by becoming more separate. Modern couples are very interesting. This is what I found uh, as a marriage counselor for, mo- for younger couples. They understand that their lives are supposed to be totally unified, but they have no clue how to negotiate. So they really do want to talk about everything. Like, uh, you know, the wife wants to have a say in everything the husband does, and the husband wants to say in everything that the wife does, but they have no clue how to negotiate. And so they just end up fighting, and they think that their role is to just accept each other's truths or something. Like, well, I, I understand why you're coming from that direction. I love you, babe. And then that... That's it. And they think they resolved the fight. It's like, no, you didn't resolve the fight. You still disagree. Resolving the fight means you have to come to an agreement together as a couple. You have to become one flesh. You're two. You need to become one. That's what we're supposed to do. Because it is that that represents the greater intimacy that we have with God. That we're no longer two, but we become one as the Holy Spirit enters into us. The Apostle Paul puts it this way. 1 Corinthians 6 Verse 14 through 20. And God both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body. But he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have given from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So the Corinthians were basically saying, well, if Jesus loves me in a spiritual sense, and I'm saved through faith, which is a spiritual acknowledgement, does he really care what I do in the body? And Paul has to say, yes, he cares what you do in the body because the Holy Spirit is in you. And he says sexual sin is the worst kind of sin. Why? Because only in sexual sin do you have the ability to become one with someone else. You're literally becoming one, and therefore you're polluting the intimacy and picture of intimacy that's presented to us in our sexuality as a whole. The relationship that God has with his people then becomes the template for our sexual practice. This is something increasingly that most Christians do not understand. We have made our sexual practice basically a rules of don'ts, right? Just don't do this, don't do this, and then you can be married and you'll have great intimacy. Uh, A worldview made up of don'ts is not a worldview that actually tells you how to do something. 
Right? It tells you what not to do, but it doesn't, doesn't tell you actually what to do. So the church has been very good at ridiculing the over-sexualization of our culture, but it has been very bad about presenting a new vision. And that's why so many people, even within the church, do not follow the divine pattern of sexuality that's laid out for us in Scripture. Because they don't understand its importance. They don't even believe it is important. There is a balance that we have to achieve as a church when we understand the sacredness of our sexuality and the joy that is within our sexuality. If you focus too much on the sacredness of your sexuality, then it appears that it's so holy that it's basically untouchable. Right? It's so holy and it's so pure and it's so amazing that basically it's no fun at all and you shouldn't be around it. Which is a tendency of church in general, right? especially if you go into more traditional churches, you're like, wow, like everything is so holy and you're so in awe, but you're like, I better not touch anything. Right, because like it's a, it's so holy that I shouldn't be around it. Like it makes you feel weird being in this space. The, the same thing could be true with our sexuality, where we think it's so holy and it's so amazing that we don't even want to engage in it. But then the other mistake is thinking that it's so pleasurable that it can't be holy. It feels too good to be a part of God. Well, no, the opposite is is correct. It feels so good because it is a part of God. Psalm sixteen verse eleven: You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. That's what intimacy with God is all about. The fullness of joy and eternal pleasure. That's why. It's not a mistake that our sexuality is so pleasurable. It is part of the symbol. It's part of the representation. To participate in the divine pattern is to couple both, is to understand it is both sacred, therefore it should be protected, but it is also pleasurable, therefore it should be enjoyed. It has to be both. If it's not both, you're missing something. Now, the people in the world, does that mean that someone in the world can't enjoy sexuality for its own sake? No, of course they can. But they're enjoying it in a temporal sense. I like how Hebrews 11 puts it when he's talking about Moses. By faith, when he, Moses, became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. Is there pleasure in the world? Of course there is, but it's passing. What does that mean? Only within this pattern... Can you take temporal actions and have eternal impact? Only in this pattern can you do that. Everything that someone who is acting outside of this pattern is experiencing is simply a temporal pleasure that will fade. It will go away. When your body dies, and by the way, your sex drive will die first before your body if you live long enough, but when your body dies, everything you've built in your sexuality dies with it. The only way it is eternally significant is if you're participating in the eternal pattern. So what Paul is saying, what the writer of Hebrews is saying, what all these other passages are saying, is that God venerates our sexuality so that it might have eternal significance. So that it might be so important and valuable that we take it seriously. This is why the Christians who are joined together in matrimony, should not just say, well, we're succeeding as long as we don't get a divorce. Go on and you're not getting a divorce. And it doesn't represent Christ, though. The representation of Christ is eternal joy and fullness of beauty and pleasure. That's what is represented. The Christian marriage should be concerned about the intimacy that they're having with one, or, one another at every level. Because every level gives you the opportunity to glorify God. To neglect it is actually to cut yourself off from one of these pleasures that we're talking about. To say like, oh, well, it's no big deal, we get along. Well, yeah, you get along, but there's something higher that God wants you to have. And it becomes significant of Him. Because not only is it an act of worship, it might be the most important element of God that is represented within our bodies. As I said before, when most people think of the divine, when most people think of heaven, Love tends to cross their brains. This is why every love song you've ever heard of talks about things like in a heavenly perspective. 
uh, even in Cinderella, right? They see they fall in love, so this is love, so this is love, so this is what makes life divine. That's the refrain of that song. Love, in some ways, especially romantic love, communicates heavenly cosmic realities. So not only do we not want to cut ourselves off from that pleasure, but we also want to be able to worship the Lord in our bodies so that other people can see the love of God acted out who may not know him. To say that what we're representing, the pattern you're seeing in our lives, is represented of a higher love that is offered to you. So when marriage breaks down, and a culture starts looking at marriage as like, what's the big deal? It's not that, it's not that important. Or even seeing marriage as a bad thing. That's significant. It's not unrelated that as excitement for marriage goes down, excitement for God goes down. It's not a mistake that as excitement for marriage goes down, excitement for life itself goes down. We'll talk more about this next time. But our relationships, our love, is the great consolation that God has given us, and it is a participation in the highest divine pattern that God wants. It is literally a picture of heaven. And I do warn people, I say, a successful marriage and the intimacy therein is as close to heaven as you're going to get. An unsuccessful marriage and the problems within is as close to hell as you're going to get on this earth. And that's unfortunate, right? C.S. Lewis named his book about hell, The Great Divorce. Okay? There's, there is something contained when a relationship does not work out and disunity starts to, to creep in. It is about as close to hell as you can get. But it's a high-risk, high-reward proposition. On the flip side is, if you treat it right, if you do it correctly, you have the opportunity to see heaven through the love that God has given you. Let's pray. Father, we love you and we thank you for this passage and what it teaches us about our sexuality and what it teaches us about you. I pray, Lord, that we would not see these things, romance and sexuality, at this low level that the world sees it, but we would see it at the high level that you have intended for us. I pray that we would approach you with the same type of fervor. We would know that you are not a God who exists in the heavens who is only out to condemn us or to shame us or to make us feel bad about ourselves, but you are God in the heavens that has invited us into your home. You have invited us to be a part of you. So Lord, I pray that we would take you up on that offer and that we would treat one another in a way that glorifies that offer and that reality. We're thankful for you, Lord, and through your Son we pray. Amen. So as we take communion, and, and once again, this is a part, right? This is a part of the engagement process as we take communion to remind ourselves of the fact that we are within the Lord, that God is in us and a part of us. So John 17, verse 11 says this, Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father, keep through your name those who have been sent and given to me, that they may be one as we are. So again, the elements of communion are only available to those who have a relationship with God. Those who do not, I ask that you let it pass by. But this action is an action, it's important we see it this way, it is an action of intimacy with God. That we are taking the elements into ourselves as a reminder of the fact that God is in us.